Fatsta Project. I leave Lord Godwin's house feeling satisfied, because I was able to secure the funding for my research, thanks to Frederick. Frederick wants to see the girl tomorrow, so I have to find her right away. I look up at the sky to see the sun above me. The girl should be at the factory at this time. Huh. Aren't I forgetting something? Oh! I promised Aretha we'd go see a kinetoscope show today. I look at my chronometer. I think there's still time to see the show with Aretha before going to the factory, but if I see the show, I'll only arrive at the factory around sundown and may not have much time to find the girl. On the other hand, if I go to the factory now, I'll have more time to look for the girl. What should I do? Meet Aretha at the theater, or look for the girl at the factory? I'm gonna go to the factory. I feel bad for Aretha, but I need to find this factory worker girl because she is important for my research. Now, where is the omnibus stop? I arrived here this morning in Professor Poe's personal carriage, but he has gone somewhere with Lord Godwin. Looking around, I find myself surrounded by big and luxurious houses. Even among the bourgeoisie, not many people can afford to live in this area. There don't seem to be any omnibuses. Everyone is riding in his own personal carriage. Occasionally there are also taxi carriages. I pick a direction and walk trying to dig into my memory of riding with Professor Poe this morning. Hmm. Uh, not here. Hmm. Wait. I think we took this turn. There really are no omnibus stops around this area. Aristocrats just don't use omnibuses, I guess. Finally, I give a signal to a passing taxi carriage, which then descends in front of me. I get on the carriage as soon as it stops. After I tell the driver my destination, the carriage takes off again and flies. Having nothing to do while sitting alone in a carriage gives me ample time to think about my research. I'm still not sure if I'll be able to find anything new from the research, but if I can get the girl to help, I should at least be able to produce some interesting experimental data. Like Professor Poe said, even if the research ultimately fails, it will be okay as long as I can add to the literature about compassion magic. I can just point out any random deviation from normal results and mention anything that correlates with that finding. I'll end the paper by noting that nothing conclusive can be inferred yet from my research, and further studies are needed to formulate a theory. The rest is up to my writing skill. Writing skill is important too. Running my thesis through a few drafts will make it shine, even if the paper doesn't offer up a scientific breakthrough. I worry about Frederick, though. He seemed genuinely interested in this research. But I'm not very confident that I'll be able to replicate what I saw yesterday at MM. Well, <laughs> that can be payback for the joke you played on me. But what was I feeling back when that girl cast her spell? Why was I so sure that she had revived the broken piano? Why did I feel that I had heard a note? What was so different about the way she cast her spell? The carriage drops me off on a street nearby the factory. The driver refused to go into the proles area. Well, at least that knocked a little bit off the fare. I walk along the city street towards the factory. It shouldn't take me long to get there, but I need to hurry. The street is quieter out here where the proles live. There are almost no vehicles crowding the sky, and most of the shops are closed. While I'm walking, I spot two people in the distance who strike me as odd, because one is a bourgeois woman, and another is a proletariat man in an unusual getup. Watching closer, I realize that the man is assaulting the woman. Give me all your money and your mana potions. Uh, I'll give you everything. Please, don't hurt me. The woman is whimpering as she takes out her money and mana potions from her purse. Here... Please let me go now. Let you go? Sure, love. In just a second. Please, don't! The man strikes the woman hard, sending her body tumbling to the ground. <laughs> Looking down at the woman, the man pops the cap off a mana potion and swigs it down. You know, 
These things taste a lot better outside of the factory. An aura of intelligence emanates from him. It bothers me to see someone so unintelligent using intelligence magic. Summon! A bucket full of water gushes out from his hand. It doesn't physically hurt the woman, but now she's completely drenched. Well, little lady, you're all wet. Maybe I should drag you back to our place and get you a dry set of clothes. Our place? Who is he referring to? The woman notices me then. Her eyes are pleading. Help! Help me! What should I do? I can use magic for sure, but I've never been in a fight. Seeing the woman asking for help, the man looks in my direction. Oi, boy, don't be causing no trouble now. Go mind your own business. Ah, oh, damn, this is bad. I quickly gather my faith and pray to the gods that my wind will be strong enough to throw him across the street. The man is preparing another water spell to attack me. He's using more mana than last time. I have to send him flying before he can unleash the water. Summon! All of a sudden, a bolt of lightning rips through the sky and strikes the man on the head. The sound is so loud that it hurts my eardrums. He collapses immediately, though he continues to convulse for a few seconds. Standing over the unconscious man is a policeman whose magical aura is still very strong, even after unleashing his magic. In a city where every citizen is capable of using offensive magic spells, it is the police's job to keep everyone in their best behavior. That's why one has to be a very powerful mage in order to join the police. Ordinary magicians aren't accepted. The police officer picks up the money and mana potions the man took from the woman and walks to her. Are you all right? He hands the money and potions to her and helps her to her feet. Yes, thank you, officer. Be careful out here. There is a group of proles going around who target the upper classes. Can you walk? Yes. Please, come with me to the police station. I need you to give a statement. Our medical staff will also take a look at you. Okay. The officer walks back to me. What were you doing here? Uh, I was just walking through when I saw the man assaulting the woman. It looked like he was going to attack me as well. I was just trying to defend myself when you came. I see. Please, be careful. These people are getting more dangerous. These people? He gives me a sharp look. Liebertons. They are members of Liebertod, a group of extremist proles. They hate the bourgeoisie and the aristocrats. Oh, I see. It's not hard to guess why they hate us. Uh, can I go now? The policeman thinks for a second. Yeah, get out of here. Just be careful, and try to avoid going to a proles area if you can. Oh, okay. I can't tell him I'm going to a proles area right now. The policeman picks up the unconscious body of the Lieberton and carries him on his shoulder. Then he and the woman get on the policeman's carriage and fly off. Despite the warning, I resume my quest to the factory in order to look for the girl. Apparently, I am literally putting my life on the line for scientific research. That's rather cool if I do say so myself. I'll have to tell Aretha at school on Moon Day. I found the factory again with little difficulty. Now I just need to find that girl. I take out my chronometer and look at the time. It's still four in the afternoon, so the girl must still be working. I can't just randomly show up at the factory and demand to see her. Who would I even demand to see? Moreover, I don't even know which section of the factory she's in. This factory is huge. Huh, that will be a problem. There's more than one exit. Where should I wait for her? I circle the factory while trying to peek inside, hoping to catch a glimpse of the girl. But it's not easy to find one girl among the many factory workers. After walking a few hundred feet, I come across a backyard. It's the same backyard I found yesterday. Not knowing where else to go, I enter through the same small opening I went through yesterday. The piano is still there. 
The sight of a piano in a factory backyard is almost surreal. It doesn't look new, but it's not that weather-worn. Someone must have dumped it here relatively recently. I walk up to the piano and inspect it, but find nothing unusual other than the fact that it's broken. No matter which key I press, it doesn't make the slightest sound. And I scan the yard to see if there are any other musical instruments around. Maybe this is a musical graveyard of sorts. But there aren't. The piano sound I thought I heard yesterday must have been nothing more than a figment of my imagination. I just keep staring at the piano, trying to explain what I had experienced, but no explanation comes to mind. The only possibility of getting an answer is to meet the girl again and watch her cast her magic again. She is the key to this research. And my decorated graduation, incidentally. I don't know how long I've been standing here. When I become aware of my surroundings again, the workers are already leaving the factory. The sun is setting. Noticing that someone is coming, I reflexively hide. But why am I hiding? It's not like I can't be here. Oh, it's that girl! She walks to the piano and sits down. Is she going to try reviving the piano again? Does she do this every day? But she just sits there, her solemn eyes glued to the piano. Why are you so quiet? Her voice almost made me jump. Has she noticed that I'm here? <laughs> I guess that's because I haven't been able to fix you, right? Oh, she was only talking to the piano. She's a bit of a weirdo, I guess. She brings her hands forward. Her eyes are closed. Both her hands are rested on the piano keys. She takes a deep breath. Her hands begin to move, pressing on the keys softly. There is no sound. The piano is still mute. But her fingers refuse to stop. They walk across the piano, putting just a tiny bit of pressure with each step. From time to time, they skip over some keys like little children skipping over a small puddle of water. The girl opens her eyes, but she doesn't seem to be looking at anything. She's in her own world, and what a peaceful world it must be. Her face is the picture of calm. It's as if all the trouble in the world vanished when she started playing her silent sonata. She shuts her eyes again for a second. When they open, they're accompanied by a subtle smile. Her body sways from side to side slowly. Like a gentle ocean wave on a lazy summer day, she drifts away from the piano, then she drifts back. Her hands move like the waves, pulling away but always, inevitably, coming back. Her eyes roll up, then her chin follows, with her head tilted slightly toward the sky and a gentle smile still visible on her lips. Sadness suddenly falls on her eyes. Her delicate hands continue to saunter gently along the piano keys, but each step is getting heavier. And then, the smile fades away, leaving only sorrow. While her right hand is still moving, the left suddenly leaps into the air. It falls back down in slow motion as the other hand continues to waltz gracefully on the piano. When her left hand touches the keys again, it joins its twin in a dance. The fingers now hop from key to key with more intensity. After a while, her shoulder jerks. Her fingers start making faster movements and fall on the piano keys with even more pressure. The piano still doesn't make any sounds, but it doesn't stop her two hands from dancing faster, as though they were chasing each other. Her face looks sad. It's almost like she is in pain. Her finger movement keeps getting heavier and heavier, until it gets really intense. Even her body is shuddering. All of a sudden, everything calms down. The girl keeps playing the piano, but it's back to the slower pace at the beginning. Her hands waltz softly, her body sways gently, and her head gnaws at the piano with eyes closed. She makes no expression. Her eyes open again, with the reappearance of a beatific smile on her lips. She smiles, but grief is still apparent on her eyes. Her face is full of emotions. There's bliss, there's serenity, but there's also despair. 
The mixture of emotions makes her look sensual. Her two hands move lazily together on the piano, like two close friends strolling along a beach. Her small fingers continue to step on the piano keys. Until at last, they come to a stop. There's no grand finale. They just eventually stop after moving slower and slower. The girl pulls her hands back to her lap and sits still. Her eyes are closed. All emotions have vanished from her face. Meanwhile, I stand here with my eyes glued to her and her piano, stunned. Even when inaudible, a musical performance can be beautiful. It's magical. Her eyes are clear and conscious when she opens them again. She's back in this world. Uh, our eyes meet. Without realizing, I have come out of my hiding place. Um, hello there. Uh, hello. This is awkward. It's times like this I wish I had Aretha's sociability. That was... That was an amazing performance. What piece was that? The girl stands up and moves closer to me, away from the piano. Oh, uh, that was actually just an etude. I mean, it's just a piece to practice my skills, but it has a really beautiful melody, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know. I couldn't hear anything. Uh, sorry, you're right. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that the piano is broken. <laughs> well, even without the sound, it was very, uh... Hmm? It was very interesting. I'm sure the music was really nice, and I bet you played it perfectly, too. That's not true at all. I made three mistakes just now. Did you? I couldn't tell at all. I didn't see you hesitate. Of course not. In a recital, you should just continue playing even if you stumble on a note. And try not to let the mistake affect the rest of your play. Besides, the audience may not even know about the mistakes unless they're also musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Uh, by the way, I'm Franz. Elise. Nice to meet you, Franz. Nice to meet you, Elise. Elise looks cheerful. The sorrowful expression she had when she was pretend playing the piano can't be seen anymore. She now wears a smile, full of joy. It seems I can now talk easily to her. I guess I didn't need Aretha's easygoingness after all. This girl already has it. I just hope she isn't perverted like Aretha, too. Though, then again, maybe that would be fine. Hey, why are you here? Uh, are you an MM engineer? Inspecting the factory? Well, actually... I tell Elise about my research, and how I had seen her try to revive the broken piano yesterday. What? You saw me yesterday? Oh, that was embarrassing! You must have thought I was strange trying to revive a broken piano. No, in, in fact, I... Ah! Uh, please don't tell anyone! Like, seriously. Pretty please. Too late. I've told Frederick, Lord Godwin, and Professor Poe. Why? Because... Elise speaks softly. I kind of tricked my supervisor into giving me an extra bottle of mana potion so I could cast the spell on the piano. Oh, don't worry. It's, it's not going to be a problem. <sighs> Thanks. She looks relieved. I never thought about it yesterday, but a factory worker couldn't normally have had enough mana left after work to cast Revive. So, are you going to try again? Try what? Reviving the piano. <laughs> My supervisor will kick me out of the factory if I ask for mana potions again. Oh, really? Well, I can get you potions. What? Actually, I belong to a research project that's interested in learning more about how compassion magic works. Elise, let's fix the piano. You could help us a lot just by trying. But is that even possible? Compassion magic doesn't work like that. Well, we don't know that for sure. I mean, you almost did it yesterday. Didn't you hear a sound from the piano when you cast your revive spell? Uh, so, it wasn't just me. That's right. And that's why you've got to try again. 
don't worry about the potions. I can get you as many as you need until we're able to fix the piano. <sighs> if we can figure out what happened yesterday, it would change the world. Elise turns to face the piano. She reaches out her hand to touch the piano slowly. I don't know whose piano this was, but it reminds me of the one we used to have at home. Well, at the house I used to call home. My parents bought this same model when I was four. I played it all the time. Like, all the time. <laughs> I was wondering how April was able to learn to play the piano. But from what she just said, I understand that she must have come from a bourgeois family. I'm curious how she fell into this life. Where are her parents now? Okay. She turns suddenly and points a finger at me. I will help you with your research. Let's fix this piano. Uh, great! Let's do it, Elise! Yeah! I'm definitely going to make this piano sing again before I turn 16. <laughs> I don't know what's so significant about turning 16, but sure, I laugh alone. <laughs> oh, by the way, I almost forgot that Frederick wants to see her magic. Uh, yeah? There's someone I'd like you to meet tomorrow. Uh, who? He is... He's my sponsor. He's the one who's funding this project. Why do I have to see him? Well, he said he wanted to see your magic. I think he's very interested in compassion magic. But I have work. Isn't tomorrow Sunday? Yeah, but I still have work. Can't you take leave? Um, I could, yeah. But we don't get paid if we don't come in. Uh, what should I do? I can't make Elise lose one day's worth of pay. But on the other hand, I don't want to disappoint Frederick. Should I just make him wait until Elise has an off day? No, that won't do. If Frederick changes his mind, I might lose the funding. Alright, the funding! Well, how about this? I will pay you twice your daily wage at the factory if you take unpaid leave tomorrow. What? N no I can't possibly take that much money from you. Don't worry, it's not my money. This project I'm doing has its own budget. You're covered. Um... She's hesitating. And here I figured any prol would be happy to be offered money. Are you sure that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'll go with you tomorrow. Great. I tell her the location of an omnibus stop between this area and my apartment, where we'll meet tomorrow morning at 9. Alright! Now I need to tell my supervisor that I won't be coming to the factory tomorrow. It sounds good. I'll see you tomorrow, Elise. See you, Franz! With a bright face, Elise begins to skip down a grassy path back to the factory to talk to her supervisor. It's getting dark. I have to go home as well. I'll take an omnibus this time. A trip by taxi carriage can easily cost more than a factory worker's daily wage. I get off the omnibus at a stop near my apartment. I walk back with light steps, feeling satisfied that I've managed to get the girl, Elise, to agree to help with my research. As soon as I'm back in my room, I lie down on the bed. I'm exhausted after everything that's happened today. Meeting Lord Godwin and pitching my research to him, going all the way to the paroles district, almost getting into a fight with a Libertad member, witnessing Elise's silent piano play, and getting her to agree to help me. That's enough excitement for one day. Especially that confrontation with Libertad. Just what the hell are they? I can understand proles hating the bourgeoisie, but something about Libertad is bugging me. But I don't want to think about that right now. I don't want to think about anything. I'm tired. So tired.
are members of Libertad, a group with an unpronounceable name. So what kind of person is the man we're meeting today? Hmm, he is the son of a lord, so, you know, a rich kid. What? And here I thought this guy was a rich kid. I think Frederick wants to see you cast compassion on something inanimate, like you did with the piano. I see that there's a piano here, but it's not broken, is it? I suppose I can break it and then... No! I look up to find a tall man standing behind me. Does your knee still hurt? No, it's completely healed now. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry you had to waste your mana on me. Let's do a project. project. 